And now it's my great pleasure, and I think we really have to acknowledge a very, very dedicated speaker, because Amanda Chamberlain is online, I think, from Australia, and look at your clock, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, calculate three, 10 hours ahead, and then, then you know really the dedication and the, well, your contribution, Amanda. So thanks very much to agreeing to give this presentation live. I really, really appreciate this. No problem. Thanks, Elizabeth. Oh, sorry, uh, Krista. I was just thinking Eliz Elizabeth. Um, it is really good to be here. It is very early in the morning for me, so I apologise if um, I maybe doze off in the middle of this, but I hopefully we'll get through to the end. Um, I wanted to talk about, um, we've had, heard a lot today about the use of functional information and I guess um, the prospects of this improving accuracy of genomic prediction. And so um, I wanted to talk a bit about the functional information that we've used to prioritise causal variants for complex traits. And Radong touched on this uh, this morning. Sorry, need to get the slides moving. Um, and it, you know, described the that we've uh, used functional information um, to develop a custom SNP chip, and we've established that that has improved the genomic predictions uh, for milk production traits in Australia. Um, but since that that we developed that chip, um, there's been a, a what I'm calling a functional revolution, and we've got much more data that's become available. And we've been working with many partners to create or access as much functional data as possible, um, including you guys at Bulbrick. Uh, when uh, Krista asked me to uh, speak to you today, she wanted me to touch on some of the things that we've been doing at Agriculture Victoria. So I'm gonna, um, I guess, explain the data sets that we have and touch on some of the, the results that we've um, gotten from that data in the last few years. So our most extensive um, data set is our RNA, RNA seq data. Um, we've generated expression atlas data where we, we I guess we've focused really on looking at um, allele specific expression, um, but we've got um, expression QTL data sets. Um, there's a list of the, the tissues that we've got there and you can see from the logos that we're partnering with lots of people to get um, either share our data um, or access other people's data uh, there. And we're really focusing on um, as many, I guess, expression phenotypes as we can. So we're looking at gene expression, exon expression, splicing, allele specific expression, and more recently, RNA editing. Um, we've generated a lot of chips data where we've focused on um, allele specific binding and chromatin states um, in our atlas data. Um, and we're looking at histone and allele-specific allele -specific binding QTL in our histone QTL data sets. And that's work we're collaborating with um, LIC uh, in New Zealand on. We've got a small amount of cage seat data that we've generated in collaboration with the University of Queensland. Um, and we've focused on finding uh, transcription start sites, enhancers and super enhancers. And we've generated a small amount of high C data that's enabled the detection of TADS and AB compartments. So I guess just a couple of snapshots of some of the things that we've done with this data. Um, Radon talked about this this morning, so I'm not going to go into detail about it. Um, but this work, which um, he's partnered with uh, the Cattle GTEx project to do, really highlights the importance of regulatory variants or expression QTL and their um, impact on complex traits and the value that we can get from using them um, to improve our genomic predictions. Uh, we've had a bit of a focus in, in our, I guess, our new dairy bio program on health and fertility. Um, and so we've got a project, um, or, uh, sorry, a piece of work here that has been led by Irena Vandenberg um, in collaboration with um, Dairy NZ. And basically she's found that variants that are associated with carbon interval are enriched in all types of expression QTL. She's um, done this with uh, a mix of Australian data, which is the table that you can see at the top there. Um, the Australian data set was the um, 60,000 cows with um, carving interval records. Um, and, in, in, and whole genome imputed sequence data. And she's basically done a meta-analysis to find QTL for carving interval. 
um, combine that with the gene expression data from uh, 380 uh, Holstein liver samples. Um, these set cows um, have been bred to be high and low fertile uh, lines of Holsteins, um, and so they provide quite a, a unique opportunity to look at fertility. Um, and she's done um, expression QTL mapping uh, for all of the, the expression QTLs that we're interested in. Um, and the table down the bottom here just highlights that for all four expression QTL types, so gene expression, exon expression, allele-specific expression and splicing, you can see that the variants that are QTL for carving interval are significantly enriched in all the expression QTL types when you compare them to the entire genome. So 8% um, uh, of the, in, the variants in the entire genome um, are significant gene expression QTL, um, but 50% of the carving interval QTL uh, are gene expression QTL. So that's a pretty significant um, increase in, in enrichment. Um, and these are obviously going to be very um, interesting targets for us to look at. There's an example here of a QTL region on chromosome 6, which has already been discussed today. So this is the GC locus on chromosome 6. It's a well-known pleiotropic QTL in dairy cattle. It's associated with production traits, mastitis resistance, mammary gland morphology and fertility. Um, and these plots show the significant GWAS hits in red uh, for calving interval on the, that top left plot uh, for gene expression of GC uh, in the top right, for exon expression of GC in the bottom left, and allele-specific expression at heterozygous sites in the GC gene on the bottom right. Uh, Claire Prowse-Wilkins is a PhD student that we had here, um, and as a part of her project, she used um, our Chipsec Atlas data set um, and found that Chipsec peaks were enriched in um, 11 causal SNP data sets. Um, this is the plot that you can see here and the yellow bars show that um, they're all enriched uh, in uh, these, all these Chipsec peaks are enriched in these data sets. The highest enrichment in the five milk production QTL at the top. She, um, I thought this was a bit too good to be true. So she decided to just use um, the peaks where that were correlated with nearby gene expression. And that's the, um, the further enrichment that you can see in the blue bars there. So that just improved the situation. But um, as I mentioned, we've got a real, real interest in allele specific regulation and expression of genes. So Claire extended the data set. So the, that original data set was in six tissues. Um, this uh, data set I'm presenting here is 22 tissues. And she's tested um, over 40,000 exons and 380 to 460,000 chipset peaks for the, for the, you know, the five fang marks, I guess we're talking about here, um, tested them for allele specific expression or binding respectively. Um, so although the majority of the significant exons and peaks were tested in multiple tissues, a large proportion of these were only significant in one or few tissues. This is the plot you can see here for allele specific expression and binding. And the blue areas in those bars um, show the proportion of the either exons or peaks that are only um, showing the allele specificity in one tissue. Um, you can see that um, allele specific, specific binding tends to be a bit more tissue specific at around 50 to 60% um, than allele specific expression is around 40%. However, it's possible that the direction of the bias is actually the same in the other tissues, but there's just not enough power for us to, uh, I guess, reach the reach significance. So, this table here at the bottom shows the percentage of times the direction of the effect was the same in 0 to 20, 20 to 40, all the way up to 80 to 100 percent of the other tissues that it was tested in. Um, and this was averaged across the three cows. So you can see that the majority of the exons with significant allele specific expression in at least one tissue showed the same direction of bias across more than 60 percent of the tissue tissues tested. Um, however, when we look at the, uh, the four histone marks in CTF here, this drops to about 40%. Claire found that up to 17% of the peak exon pairs were significantly correlated. And as you would expect, expect the vast majority of these were um, uh, 
co uh, positively correlated for the activating marks, so H3K27AC um, and H the the K4ME um, methylation marks here, the majority of these are positive correlations. Um, so that means that the peak height was correlated with um, high exon expression. And this is what other studies have also found. Um, interestingly, the repressive mark H3K27ME3 only had slightly more negative correlations than positive. Um, and CTCF is roughly equal as you would uh, expect. Um, we hypothesized that the allele specific binding of histone marks or transcription factors, factors was actually resulting in the allele specific expression of nearby genes. So for example, if there is bias towards binding to the maternal chromosome, you, would, you should observe a higher exon expression from the maternal chromosome. Um, but the plots here show that just over 50% of the time, the direction of the allele specific binding and expression was the same for, and this is for the um, activating mark H3K27AC. And this indicates that there's no or little correlation between allele specific binding and allele specific expression other than what you'd expect by chance. And all the other marks show the same relationship. So allele specific binding does not necessarily lead to allele specific expression. So in our cage sec data, which was a collaboration with the University of Queensland, we were able to find uh, evolutionary and developmental stage differences in transcription start site usage. Um, so Taurus and Indicus diverged up to uh, half a million years ago. So we put together this data set that combined Indicus from the University of Queensland and Taurus from our own samples. And we also um, threw in there some fetal and adult uh, tissue comparisons. The top plot here, shows um, the differentially differential transcription start site usage between Taurus in blue and uh, Indicus in red for three different genes. Um, just note that the change in scale on the y-axis actually highlights the differences uh, even further when you're looking at these plots. Um, so you can see that we've got a few interesting examples there where you basically the first gene is um, switching the dominant transcription start site between Indicus and Taurus. The other two, you've got uh, many, uh, I guess, um, Taurus transcription start sites, which uh, in Indicus you, becomes one dominant one. And we were looked at, able to look at uh, about 470 SNP that occurred among these differential uh, transcription start sites. Um, and you could see that there were shifts in the allele frequency between the Bos indicus and Bos taurus subspecies at these sites. The bottom plot shows the differential transcription start site usage between fetus in blue and the adult in red. And there's just three examples here. The, the two on the left are from lung and the one on the right is from, sorry, the two on the left are from liver, the one on the right is from lung. Um, and there's, you know, an interesting example there in the middle where you've got exclusive transcription start site usage um, in the fetal and adult stages. So Christy Vanderjuk in our team did some further work looking at this data set to discover enhancers um, and super enhancers. In particular, she's really looking for enhancers that are differentially expressed in the mammary gland, because um, obviously we're, we're working uh, in, in dairy cattle, and so that's of interest to us. So these little plots here are some examples uh, where you can see in orange, um, the higher expression of these enhancers compared with the gray dots, which are the other uh, tissues that we were looking at. She found 47 of these differentially expressed mammary gland enhanced candidates, which are of high interest to us. So she also looked for these super enhancers. This is a little bit hard to see, but the, um, this is a, a region on chromosome 6 that um, actually is a major milk protein gene locus, which has the three casein genes on it. Um, and so this solid pink bar just demonstrates the location of this super enhancer that she's detected. There are nine enhancer candidates there in the next track that make up this super enhancer. And these are all highly expressed in the mammary gland and show significant co-expression with the transcription start site candidates for these three casein genes. 
Um, and the, the third track there is just the, um, I guess, the, the tags and the coverage across this region. And when we're looking at in, um, for enhancers, you're looking for this bi-directionality um, of, the, of the expression. Um, it's a little bit hard to see because it's quite small, but there's some really um, nice examples of that bi-directionality in there. Um, and we were able to find 200, sorry, 28,000 of these putative super enhancers. And back to our original question, which functional information is useful for the prioritization of causal variants for complex traits? Um, so uh, the, the work that Radon talked about a little this morning where we were, um, I guess, uh, developing our custom chip. So he developed the FAITH um, score, which uh, Elisabetta mentioned in her, in her talk previous to this one. So Radon's had another go at this and he's developed a new score. It's called the Functional and Evolutionary Multi-Trait Importance Score, FAMI score. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail uh, on this, but basically he's used this score in a similar way, I guess, to, to the FAITH score and ranked 16 million variants in the bovine genome using phenotypes from 16 dairy traits. Um, and we tried to get a bit of a focus on our health and fertility traits in there from 100,000 cows. Uh, these are the data sets that we put together um, to annotate the 16 million variants. Um, so you can see at the top there, we've got SNP annotations, which are, are, are pretty standard. Um, we've got CHIP and ATAC-seq data sets from the, I guess, the FANG uh, groups. So that primarily came from us and uh, UC Davis, the publicly available sets there. Um, you can see the cage seq data, which I just discussed, uh, the high C AV compartments that we've also got, uh, QTL from animal, QTL DB, um, our expression QTL, our own uh, from our own data sets, but also from cattle DTEX, um, ASC QTL from some of our uh, our data as well, uh, the chipset QTL. So these are um, another data set that Claire uh, produced as a part of her PhD in uh, 100 mammary gland samples. Um, some molecular QTL, uh, one of them um, which Radon used in the previous uh, uh, publication, but um, some new um, meta meta metabolite uh, QTL, um, some CISNIP statistics, which he used last time, uh, the selection signatures that he used last time, um, some conserved sites from some um, publicly available data sets, and um, some interesting, I guess, statistics around whether a, a the SNP from the thousand bull genomes was rare or common in Indicus versus in Taurus, and um, some um, human data sets that have been mapped across to bovine, uh, one being where the, the variants are considered harmful to human, um, whether it was a, a significant QTL in the UK, UK biobank uh, or whether it occurred in a brain enhancer. Uh, this first plot shows the distribution of the sequence variants based on the number of functional and evolutionary annotations. So you can see some of these variants had up to eight, uh, sorry, uh, 12 annotations. 84% of the 16 million variants had at least one. Uh, the bottom chart here shows um, that there's a tendency for the variants with more functional annotations uh, or evolutionary annotations uh, to be more pleiotropic, which is what is on the y-axis here. Uh, and finally, uh, the money shot, I guess, um, is uh, the ranking of the functional ev evolutionary classes that we tested based on their effects on the pleiotropy of these 16 traits. The larger circles here are more significant. The blue ones are significant and the gray ones are not. And the first thing you can see is that uh, most of these are blue. Um, they're, they're, they're varying effects, but most of these are blue. So they're, they're informative. Um, for ranking the variants. Um, at the top of the list there is our uh, polar lipid uh, QTLs. Um, they have a big effect, but there's not that many of them. Uh, through the, the rest of the top of that list, there's a lot of expression QTL, which um, and there's a lot of those and they have a pretty decent impact. But you can see all of the other um, data sets in there that I've discussed. So there's the the um, chip and attack seq data sets from FANG. There's our histone QTLs. There's the cage seq transcription of start sites um, and enhancers. The high C um, uh, AB compartments are in there. A lot of this data is, is proving to be very useful. So in conclusion, 
Not all functional data is created equal, but most of it appears to be useful for prioritization of variance. And, and I would probably say the more, the better. Um, but we're now focused on um, health and fertility and applying this to generate functional data from animals and developmental and physical, physiologically relevant time points. Um, I'll acknowledge the Agriculture Victoria team, um, our collaborators, including those at Bob Rigg. Um, it's been a great uh, collaboration to work with. These are just a few of the people that I've interacted with, but there's obviously many, many more of you um, that have been a part of the project as well. Thank you, and thanks for having us as a part of the team. Thank you, Amanda. So we have to learn about a new score again, so we have to keep track of all of them. <laughs> Other questions to Amanda? There's one up there from Elisabetta. Hi, Amanda. Thanks a lot for your talk. Well, I'm not an expert on that, but uh, could you summarize in few words the difference between the FAVE scores and this new score, FAMI, or FAMI? Um, uh, it would probably be better to hear this from Radon, but um, it's a slightly different, uh, I guess, approach. Um, he's, they've used a lot of uh, Bayes-R to look at the um, impact of the variance, uh, Bayes-RC, sorry, um, to look at the uh, impact of the variance and determine uh, the, the rankings. Yeah, so uh, I have a question about, so you, you my impression was that you, you're focusing on SNP variation, so point mutations. But I would assume that you have also activities on structural variants affecting quite a lot of more DNA in, in, in the genome. So what, what do you do with the structural variants? And how do you deal with them with you predicting functionality? Um. Really happy that you asked that question. Uh, so Agriculture Victoria in um, partnership with University of Queensland have just launched a bovine long way consortium where we're trying to do exactly that. Um, I guess emulating the Thousand Bull Genomes Project where we're um, looking for structural variants, but we're also planning to, I guess, provide imputation uh, reference populations back to people so that they can then impute these structural variants into their own populations and we can all start to look at the impact these structural variants have on the complex traits that we're interested in and start to incorporate those into our genomic predictions as well. Thank you. Then I have one question here from the uh, online audience. Uh, Dominique Rochard, he asked, which tissue did you study for the high C work on the three lactating cows? That was liver, yeah. Okay, that's quick. 